Okay, welcome. So we'll get started. So welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Environmental Health and Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, we welcome you all back to the second session in this three-part series. This is Ellen Webb and I work with the Center for Environmental Health, otherwise known as CEH. CEH, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is a national not-for-profit with offices in Oakland, California, and New York City. We focus on the protection of families and communities from toxic chemicals, and we work to protect protect communities so that they can all and we can all live in healthy environments. So last week um, in the first session we covered community changes and we provided an overview of community impacts um, and we talked about the highly industrialized process of unconventional oil and gas extraction and how the process can change the social fabric of a community. We talked about things like increased levels of noise and how that can increase stress difficulty sleeping and can exasperate physical outcomes and of existing health problems. We also talked about uh, what communities have been reporting um, in terms of changes in social norms and a perceived loss of social cohesion where ongoing unconventional oil and natural gas development is taking place and how this can lead to issues such as mental health issues. So today in part two uh, we're going to be hearing from some clinicians as they share their perspectives on mental health impacts occurring at the community level. So today uh, we're going to be talking about has how as knowledge has been increasing about fossil fuel extraction and development, public health professionals and clinicians are developing best practice recommendations for physicians and community health centers and, and their patients. In this panel, social workers and clinicians will discuss some of the problems seen in patients with stress, anxiety, and mood, and will also talk about what is being seen in local impacted areas and what is being done to develop resources to help residents whose mental health has been affected by this development process. So we're pleased today that we have some great uh, speakers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, who is Dr. L Larissa Durska. Dr. Durska is a board certified pediatrician and former director of pediatrics at Holy Name Hospital. Following residency and board certification in pediatrics, Dr. Durska practiced general pediatrics and held the position of director of pediatrics at Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck, New Jersey. Her recent work has been focused on children's rights with the Conference of NGOs at the United Nations Committee on Children's Rights. She is a graduate of Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. She has been a SUNY Sullivan Community College Board of Trustees member since 2009, appointed by Governor Patterson. Dr. Durska is an advocate for health on the issue of natural gas exploration and production. She is a founding member of Sullivan Area Citizens for Responsible Energy Devi Development. And she is also Vice Chair of the CME Curriculum Committee for Physician Scientists and Engineers for Healthy Energy. Um, she, together with fellow New York medical colleagues, she founded Concerned Health Professionals of New York. So Larissa, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm now gonna um, switch this over to you so you can get started. So just give me one second here. Did the little icon pop up? Did you get that? Yep, and I clicked on it, so hopefully you see my screen. Oh, yep, I think we can, so you can go ahead and get started. Okay, let me first tell you that I'm transmitting this from Germany, so if you have a little bit of a delay, I apologize for that. Um, in this session, uh, what I'd like to do is um, give you um, 
uh, first a general overview of what we see as pediatricians as it concerns mental health in children, and then what we've observed in children living in gas development areas. All children misbehave or act up or, or feel sad. They um, argue with their siblings or classmates at one time or another, but it's usually typical or, or normal childhood behavior, not a cause for concern. While children could experience problems from time to time with their mood or behavior, in some cases these problems could be a normal part and these problems could be a normal part of their um, uh, stage of development. In other cases, behavioral emotional problems may be understandable reactions to a change in a child's environment. And in even smaller, smaller number of cases, when a child is defiant or angry most of the time, or often seems to be unhappy, or when people uh, involved with a child, such as parents, teachers, child care providers, report having problems, it may be appropriate to seek professional help. It's when a child's problems persist over a long period of time or begin to interfere with his or her relationships with family and peers, with performance in school or everyday living that you might consider this to be a sign of a mental health problem or disorder. As you can see in this graph, mental health problems are relatively common among young people. In fact, they're as common as a fracture. Uh, sometimes these problems can have serious consequences for early learning, for social competence, and even lifelong physical health. So they must be recognized and attended to. Children can show clear characteristics of anxiety disorder, neurodevelopmental disabilities, such as autism at a very early age. That said, young children respond to and process emotional experiences and traumatic events in ways that are different from older children and adults. And for that reason, diagnosis in early childhood can be even more difficult than it is in adults. The good news is that children are resilient um, and they do respond well to therapy. Support and treatment can improve the lives of children with mental health problems. And the path to improved health often becomes with the family's awareness of concerning behaviors. And identification of children at risk is very important in the public health strategy of addressing this uh, issue in children. But diagnosing mental health disorders in children can be difficult because many different factors can affect children's moods and behaviors, including physical health problems, experiences in their environment, or even other mental health disorders. For this reason, a mental health evaluation is often essential to, under, to understanding better a child's difficulties and how best to help this child. If a child complains of an earache, most caregivers know they should take that child to a doctor and what to expect from the visit. But when a child is having emotional or behavioral problems, the approach to getting help is clear. The main people who are best situated to be the best uh, and the first interveners of mental health issues and therefore best help the child are those who spend the most time with that child, the family, the primary care doctor or nurse practitioner, and school teachers. But where to turn next is the subject of this next slide, which I know is very busy, but I'll try to summarize briefly. Um, you can use it as a reference later to identify when a specific type of evaluation is recommended, who should do it, and why. But in brief, a mental health evaluation or assessment is a process by which professional gains, a professional gains detailed information about a child's difficulties in order to make an accurate diagnosis and provide recommendations for the most appropriate treatment. The type of problem a child is experiencing will determine the type of evaluation that's needed and where it will could be completed. It could take place in a child's school, others are at medical centers, community mental health centers, or private offices. And many different professionals provide that mental health care for children, do so, doing so in a variety of settings. And the type um, um, uh, a professional depends on the nature and severity of a child's problems and the types of services needed. A good place to start though is with your pediatrician or primary care provider. Uh, that person can rule out certain medical problems that could be involved and there are many that, that cause a child to be irritable, um, 
or, or experience school problems, such as uh, visual problems. Um, and, and that pediatrician or primary care provider can give you guidance about whether your child's behaviors are within the range of what's considered normal child development or if the behaviors need further evaluation. I cannot point you to a study specifically dealing with children and mental health in gas fields because none exist as yet on this issue. But there are some, um, but there are problems um, uh, that we've encountered. Those of us working with impacted people, we've observed these children and and adults. And um, let me try to give you a, a, an overview. As with children everywhere, awareness about the mental health of children living in gas fields comes from those who are in close contact with the child, and that would be the family, the primary care provider, and the school. Those of us in the health field who spend time with families living in gas developed areas are aware of numerous complaints about children's behavior and school performance. From the peer reviewed literature, such as Elaine Hill and others, we know that children born to mothers exposed to hazardous pollutants and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are more likely to have lower IQs and developmental delays. They're more likely to be born at a lower birth weight, and that's an obstacle to a good start in life, and this may in turn hinder a child's development. If a child starts out life with an obstacle, it may cause development delay is much more difficult for that child to catch up later and they become frustrated and angry. They'll need special assistance in childhood and in school. In addition to known developmental and IQ issues, children are exposed to various and experience physical problems. For example, the World Health Organization has identified noise as a cause of poor school performance and behavior problems. There are also neurological and cardiovascular problems uh, associated with this insult. Children who become ill and have to miss school. As a child um, uh, whose uh, story was written up by uh, Bamberger and Oswald, a child with arsenic poisoning who lived near gas wells, waste impoundments, and compressors. That child suffered academically because that child lost a year in school. In addition to the pain that he suffered, other children whose families I've interviewed have undergone testing in the individualized education program because they're doing poorly, and they live near fractals and compressors. Another observation is that parents are having mental health problems, and if parents are having problems coping, this reflects on children's behavior. Chronic stress, as can be experienced when children are in an environment where caregivers are coping poorly and with the addition of chronic environmental insults, can damage the architecture of the developing brain and can increase the likelihood of significant mental health problems that may emerge either quickly or years later. Because of its enduring effects on brain development and other organ systems, stress can impair school readiness, academic achievement, and both physical and mental health in children and later adults. Life circumstances associated with family stress, such as um, persistent poverty, and many of these families that we know live in poor rural areas, threatening toxics and other difficult conditions for children, elevate the risk of serious mental health problems. Environmental um, health project um, uh, is, is beginning to look at mental health. Um, both the clinical and research teams at, at Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project realized that many people in the gas fields have stressed by the gas development in their area, in addition to having experienced health effects. And they began administering the SF36, which is designed to measure health-related quality of life, both physical and mental. It's important because it tells us how they think 
their functioning. It's often used in medical settings to gauge patients' quality of life given a medical condition, but it's used widely to gauge people's perception of their own quality of life given that generally people have physical or psychological stressors at some points in their lives. The SF36 is often taken repeatedly or after um, after months or years um, to see, for instance, if someone's sense of well-being improves over time or whether it declines. It's a standardized test and therefore the scores it provide, provides are compared with the country as a whole. Once the team realized that there were in fact psychological stressors in the gas fields and that the children were suffering untoward effects, they developed a health assessment form specific for the pediatric population. And a psychological evaluation with an age-appropriate checklist, this one for age 4 to 10 years, this one for ages 11 to 17 years. If there's a problem that a person is serious, the team might suggest further evaluation, perhaps starting with the pediatrician. And um, on a previous slide, there was a list of uh, health professionals um, who could be consulted and what the cases are, the seriousness of the case and, um, um, and the nature of the case, who those people should be that uh, one would consult. Other resources for the family are those they trust, such as family members or close friends, the teachers or administrators at the child's school, members of their religion group or they may be able, all of these people may be able to offer suggestions about steps to take to get help. The good news is that mental health problems among children are very treatable but more attention really does have to be paid to identify the risk factors and those most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you Larissa that was great. So we're now going to go on to the next presenter. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Lenny Rezik. And uh, just give me one moment here while I pull up Lenny's slide. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Rezek is um, is a family nurse practitioner with the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. Dr. Rezek is a native of Southwestern Pennsylvania, received her diploma from Presbyterian University Hospital School of Nursing, her bachelor's and master's degrees in nursing from the University of Pittsburgh, and her doctor of philosophy degree from DeQuesne University. Before joining the EHP as a family nurse practitioner, she held the position of clinical professor, Noble Dick Endowed Chair in Community Outreach, Executive Director for Community-Based Health and Wellness Center for Older Adults, and as well Director of Family Nurse Program at DeQuesne School University School of Nursing. She has published and presented nationally and internationally on topics related to nurse-led community-based wellness centers. Her research interests include health and wellness and the meaning of health among vulnerable populations. In 2015, she was appointed Professor Emerita at, at DeQuesne University School of Nursing. Dr. Rezek today will be discussing lessons learned regarding emerging health issues related to unconventional oil and gas development. Okay, so Dr. Rezek, I'm going to unmute you here and then you can get started. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Dr. Deriska, for the excellent presentation on the pediatric population. I will be discussing emerging physical and mental health issues related to unconventional oil and gas development, and I will share with you what we've learned from the clients who seek health services at Environmental Health Project or EHP. And I will also, uh, I will share what I've learned through um, prior to joining the staff of EHP last year through a qualitative uh, research study that I led with three other nurse colleagues in southwestern Pennsylvania. Our mission 
at Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health, or EHP, addresses public health concerns. Our mission is to respond to individuals and communities' need for access to accurate, timely, and trusted public health information and health services associated with natural gas extraction. The objectives today, uh, what I hope to do, I'm going to talk about some of the common reasons clients come to EHP. And I'm also going to talk about some of the commonly reported symptoms and physical findings, and also about some examples of the voiced experiences of clients living in close proximity to unconventional oil and gas development. And I will also talk about uh, some of the challenges encountered by healthcare providers who are caring for individuals living in the communities experiencing a proliferation of UOGD or unconventional oil and gas development. Um, as a background to the slides that will follow, this slide shows the chemicals commonly found in emissions as noted by the National Institute's Institute of Occupational Safety and Health or NIOSH. This chart shows the common chemicals, the exposure routes and symptoms and target organs of the identified chemicals commonly associated with UOGD activities. So this gives some background about the exposure routes, about the common chemicals listed here, the ethyl benzene, the benzene, the toluene, the symptoms and the target organs. This slide also talks about a continuation of the xylene, the formaldehyde, and the sulfur oxides. But I want to uh, uh, call your attention to the PM 2.5. This is particulate matter. A 2.5, it's very, very small, microscopic dust-sized particles. So small, you can't see them with the naked eye. To give you an idea of how big they are, you could fit several thousand PM 2.5 particles on a period at the end of a sentence. That is how small they are. Now, when these particles, these tiny particles, combine with chemicals known to be toxins, these toxin-laced tiny chemicals can be inhaled, and they travel, they can travel deep into the small air sacs of the lungs. And the body isn't good at blocking the inhalation of these small particles. And they are small enough to pass into the body's uh, respiratory system, but also they can penetrate into the bloodstream. And I'm pointing this out to you because in areas, uh, the studies have shown in areas where there's pollution, air pollution, and the PM 2.5 levels are higher, these many people have found, they have found to have more heart attacks, uh, depressed lung function, and worse asthma and die at a younger age. Now, the proliferation of um, unconventional oil and gas development in southwestern Pennsylvania is relatively new compared to other areas of the country, such as Texas, Colorado, and Wyoming. And other areas have written about health issues. And I'm pointing this out to, um, to, to the audience because the symptoms reported by clients seen in our EHP office are consistent with reported health systems in other regions and locations where res residents are experience exposures longer than in southwestern Pennsylvania. Where the asterisk is yeah, under a category, these are also the generalized sy symptoms reported by the clients who have sought health services at EHP. Um, birth outcomes and cancer risks take a longer period of time to develop and appear. So um, we haven't seen them at this time. The EHP um, looked at well over 100 records of clients who've sought health services um, at EHP. And only client records that were complete that did not include clients who worked for the industry and clients who lived with, went in one um, kilometer to UOGD and whose symptoms were related to the onset um, in, a, in a time fashion to the development of unconventional and oil gas um, and was not potentially explained by other exposures or medical conditions were included in a symptom analysis. And when we went through it, there were 54. Uh, and I want to stress that these were records of clients who came to us. And these were not random samples of clients in the community. By knowing what's being admitted into the air and knowing what symptoms may, may appear if exposures to the chemicals are significant enough, we can better know if there's a possibility that the condition is related to an exposure and if there is something we can do to work with the client to break the pathway of exposure. 
It also gives us information for further investigation by other researchers. So the health system analysis revealed these uh, major symptoms. It was mainly uh, irritated uh, throat, sinus symptoms, cough, headaches, rash, burning of um, the eyes, also nausea, vomiting, and sleep disturbances. Now. Um, Dr. Dariska has already talking about the uh, SF36 survey that we do uh, with, when client, when, with clients when they come in. It's a screening that we do with all of our clients. I'm not going to go into it because next week Lydia Greiner, who is the psychiatric nurse practitioner at EHP, will discuss in detail her work, which looked at the impact of shale gas development in southwestern Pennsylvania on a cohort of people from the area. She used the SF36 instrument. And it, we also found that uh, she found that the uh, results were lower than those when compared to the general population in the United States. And we also see that with the clients who seek services at EHP. I want to talk a little bit about the vulnerable populations at risk. Vulnerable populations, uh, such as persons with pre-existing chronic disease states, people with asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease in the elderly, pregnant women and children may be more sensitive to the exposures and experience more harmful effects than the general population. Some individuals may also have been sensitized to chemicals by an exposure and develop multiple chemical sensitivities that cause them to have intense reactions to low levels of exposure and to an array of different chemicals. Many older adults, um, especially those living alone, and have spoken to, to us and they have mentioned that they were afraid to speak out. Uh, older adults I have talked to report concern for safety, unlocking the doors when they didn't do this prior to the onset of the UOGD. Women living alone often fear speaking out to neighbors about their concerns, especially if neighbors have leased or are working in the industry. Many have voiced their worry about adult grandchildren working in the grand, uh, gas fields and driving trucks. Older adults with pre-existing chronic diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and hypertension often report an exacerbation of symptoms. Many report increasing insomnia and a depression. An increased isolation is another commonly reported experience. They report staying inside the house due to the odors in the air. And many are afraid of driving and the new traffic patterns um, brought about in their community because of the truck traffic. Older adults I have spoken to often mention that their young grandchildren don't come to visit them or stay in their homes any longer for fear of exposure to toxins. And there are changes in such things as to where holidays and family events are celebrated because of fear of exposures. They talk about the changing neighborhoods, neighbors who have lived in the same neighborhood for generations and are now pitted against neighbors, and family members not talking to each other. In a study uh, led by Jim Alaika in 2015, he found that Pennsylvania hospitals in geographical areas with higher uh, gas well intensities, in these areas they had higher cardiology and neurology and patient hospital admissions. Dr. Dariska talked about um, birth outcome, or uh, children and um, difficulties related to birth outcomes. Although I have talked to pregnant women who have called into the EHP office for spec monitors, I don't have first-hand data on birth outcomes from clients we have seen at EHP uh, in the office at this time. However, adverse birth uh, outcomes have been reported in a number of cohorts across the country. In a recent study uh, looking at over 100,000 births in rural Colorado, the research has found an association between living closer to fracking sites and an increased rate of congenital heart defects and neurotube defects. In a study looking at over a million births from uh, 2003 to 2010 in Pennsylvania, it was reported that there was an increase in the number of low birth weights, and that's less than 5.5 pounds, as well as lower APGAR scores at five minutes in infants born to mothers living within 1.6 miles of a fracking site. And this is compared to infants born to mothers living further than this from a well. 
low weight birth babies can have more problems right after birth, such as difficulty breathing on their own, increased risk of infection, and the possibility of having to stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. Later um, in life, low birth, uh, low birth weight has been associated with lower educational attainment and health problems such as high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes. Besides the emotional cost of having a baby born with birth defects or low birth weight, there is also the cost to the healthcare system to consider. Cassatis and uh, colleagues investigated the potential of the impact of unconventional oil and gas development chemicals on hormonal activities um, based on plausible exposure to contaminated water. They concluded that there are a number of potential plausible exposures that could have significant endocrine impacts and could cause adverse reproductive effects in pregnancy outcomes. They also concluded that there is a need for more focus on understanding the effects of exposure on the endocrine system. Children, uh, Dr. Driska had already given a really great review of the pediatric population and symptoms we have observed in the gas field. Children, has, as someone described, have a longer shelf life than adults. They breathe faster. They're closer to the ground. They put uh, things in their mouth, and they're more apt to have exposures. I'm going to talk a little bit about a qualitative study that I led. Uh, Dr. Ruth McDermott-Levy mentioned the study uh, last week and how the findings of her qualitative study in Wyoming County, Pennsylvania were very similar to this study that was done in southwestern Pennsylvania. This was a qualitative study, a qualitative phenomenological approach. I led it with colleagues Dr. Joyce Nestrich, Dr. Mona Counts, and Leslie Pizzuto, and it was published in 2013. This approach, this qualitative approach, is often used to give voice to voiceless populations. And this idea for this study and approach came from women in southwestern Pennsylvania who were attending a community meeting that I was attending. The women were angry, and in their words, they felt they were voiceless. They felt that no one was listening to them regarding their concerns about health and the increase in drilling that was going on near their homes. And from this conversation, this study was started. We focused the study on health and environment. We sought to understand from the women in this region the meaning of health within the context of the environment. And we interviewed women from Washington, Green, and Fayette counties in the summer of 2012. The themes from this study have been repeated in the health assessments I have been completing uh, in my current role as a family nurse practitioner at EHP. The themes are also very similar to the findings discussed last week uh, in the work of Dr. Perry and also Dr. McDermott-Levy. And these are place that matter, place matters and powerlessness. First, place that matters. Some background regarding place that matters. According to a recent report by Haley and colleagues, most setbacks from unconventional oil and gas development are not based on science or evidence-based and are not sufficient to protect public health. The topography of the land is important as to where the home is located, downstream or downwind to the weather patterns. In addition to the proximity to a site, it's important to know if there are one site or multiple sites for example, there could be a drilling site or one or more compressor stations, a processing plant or pipelines, or a combination of these, in addition to other industrial activities unrelated to gas uh, near their homes. Noise, as was mentioned before, can be a great stressor. Environmental noise exposure has been shown to increase the occurrence of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, affect learning and cognition in children, and play a role in endocrine changes leading to weight gain and diabetes. Noise disrupts the quality of sleep, which creates a cascade of negative impacts on health and safety. Very similar to the findings of Dr. Ruth McDermott Levy's study that she spoke of last week and Dr. Simone Perry's work, and like the clients I have spoken with in the office, the women in the study I led spoke of being forced out of the way of life that has been part of their family for generations. To quote the voice of one of the women, we live here for a reason. My great-grandfather lived here. My dad grew up here. I love my kitchen. And I mean, it's just a house, but my kid's health is not worth us staying here. But at the same time, this is our house, and we want to be here. The women that we talked to who lived further away from the drilling expressed the awareness of the changes in the environment in their area, but they described no immediate health concerns because of the distance of their living space from the drilling. 
One woman stated, I really haven't had any concerns about the health and the environment. I know a lot of people are talking about the wells that are going on in the Marcellus Shale. I really don't know what it means, but there's none near me. I mean, there might be one like four miles from me, but that's just come in the last year, so I don't think there's been much to do with health issues late, lately. However, the women closest to the industrial activity voiced a different experience. One woman stated to me, we're 1,500 feet and my neighbor is like 500 or 700 feet and there are two houses right immediately below this impoundment. And we didn't even know it was there. We thought it was just the well pad. And then someone through one of those meetings showed me a picture of it. I was floored. I couldn't believe that we were living under this because we didn't even know it. They never told us anything about an impoundment. It was hidden under the trees, around the, uh, behind the trees on the hill. We knew nothing. It is not unusual for clients to express ongoing uh, chronic stress to us uh, during their visit to EHP and also fear of low-level chronic exposure, uh, exposures. Clients have brought in videotapes of sights and sounds of what they've experienced to share with us. Powerless is another theme that emerged in the interviews. Like the women I interviewed in the study, Clients I see in the office often describe the powerlessness they feel causing stress. They talk about how they can't go outside without having to worry about the air and diesel fumes. They talk about not being able to use the well water and the unending noise, the vibration causing pictures to fall from the walls at times, and the light in the once dark skies, and not being able to see the stars anymore. They talk about the constant truck traffic, the fear of their pets being run over, and fear of driving on the roads and unable to sleep, and the growing irritability. One of the clients I spoke to on the phone expressed, they are just going to get away with it. The clients I've talked to have had similar experiences to the women I talked to in the study. The women in the study described a lack of respect, injustice, and at times they felt that they were being blamed as the victim. One woman stated, we might be country, but we're not stupid. One woman described, I was accused of poisoning my elderly father because he got sick at home, but improved once hospitalized. I realized later that it was the contaminated well water in our home, and I was the one encouraging him to drink because he had an indwelling catheter. The women I interviewed in the study described a lack of transparency, which resulted in distress of companies local government and regulatory agencies. One woman said, like all the illusions, all the things you thought were true have been stripped away and then you realize that what you've been living here in this country, we're not in control of our lives. The communication channels have been taken over by the industry. You can see it from the ads. Another woman stated, it's like living in a science fiction movie. I feel like I'm stuck in a bad dream and the government allowed it to happen. They don't care and they're getting away with it. Again, the same words often repeated to me by the clients I see at EHP. What about long-term exposures? Well, we really don't know at this time. However, in regard to chronic stress, studies are going on and data continue to be generated and are providing more insight on the mechanisms to help understand the hormones that are released during the stress response and the interplay among them. It is now widely accepted that stressful life events can impact the health of an individual, including immunological health. Although there are many uh, specific details yet to be identified, it is becoming increasingly clear that products of the endocrine system and products of the nervous system, such as catecholamines, can alter the function of lymphocytes. These are cells that fight body infection, as well as other cells of the immune system when a person is experiencing long-term exposures to these hormones released as a stress response. It's a challenge for clinicians to measure short-term exposures. Even although there has been extensive research conducted evaluating potential health effects, it's necessary to continue to conduct larger epidemiological studies. One frequently asked question we are asked at EHP is whether individuals living or working near UOGD sites such as well pads, compressor stations, or production facilities should undergo biomonitoring to determine if they have, they have harmful chemicals in their body as a result of exposures from these operations. 
While biomonitoring tests may be appropriate in some cases, EHP does not routinely recommend them because of their limitations. Results of biomonitoring testing in the UOGD setting are often misleading for several reasons. Most of the chemicals associated with UOGD activity are clearly um, are rapidly cleared from the body, so tests may not show the presence of a chemical or metabolite even if someone is exposed to a pollutant. Many chemicals have multiple sources of exposure in the environment. Because of this, it can be difficult to determine if a positive result from a UOGD-related exposure or is it from some other exposure. Some toxic exposures may not have an associated measurable metabolite in the blood or urine that is specific to the chemical of concern. In this scenario, even if an exposure to the environmental pollutant did occur, there may be no information available to interpret whether or not the exposure poses a health risk to the individual. There is a chance of false negative and false, false positive results. What is recommended is periodic blood tests, such as metab uh, metabolic paddles, uh, panels, that often uh, are ordered on routine physicals that include lab tests and monitor liver and kidney function. Our work at EHP is truly a team effort. I want to acknowledge the staff of EHP and consultants and collaborating physicians we work with and who have contributed to the material I have presented on behalf of the work of EHP. Thank you. I will now turn the mic over to Ellen and Jessica Chabot who will present her work with EHP. Great. Thank you so much for that, Lenny. That was great. A really excellent presentation. And it was, um, it was very interesting to hear about some of the most commonly reported symptoms and the physical findings um, of, of what's being found in individuals living in these communities. And, and also to learn about what healthcare providers need to be aware of um, as these issues come up in their communities. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we now are going to wrap up um, and finish with our um, next speaker. Um, who is going to be uh, Jessa Chabot. So Ms. Chabot is a social worker and case manager at Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. Ms. Chabot has a master's in social work from the University of Pittsburgh, and she is focused on community organization and social administration, while also becoming certified in human services management. While studying at the University of Pittsburgh, Jessa participated in a nine-month field placement at the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, which led to her officially joining the organization after graduation. These experiences have specifically presented her for her current position as case manager. In addition to being the case manager, Jessa is a member of the health and wellness team and the convener of the stress, stress team at EHP. Um, today, Ms. Chabot is going to be talking about developing community and clinical resources and what it means to be integrating these varying perspectives. Um, she'll explain how the Southwest uh, Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project has worked with residents whose mental health has been impacted by UOGD as their mission um, to provide timely, accurate, and trusted public health information. Um, so, um, Ms. Chabot, I'm going to turn this over to you in one second and you can begin. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Larissa and Lenny, for those wonderful presentations. Okay, oops. So today I will be talking about my work here at the Environmental Health Project and developing community and clinical resources, integrating varying um, perspectives. So today's topics, um, will include, include de, me describing different approaches and programs that uh, we at the Environmental Health Project have implemented to help residents dealing um, with mental health impacts of unconventional oil and gas development. Um, we will also discuss the challenges that we have faced when trying to implement new programs. And also, I will describe our current work around mental health. Uh, just a brief overview of Washington County, Pennsylvania, where our office is currently located. Um, the population here is around 208,000 people. Um, there's about 66 towns where we're located. And this is actually um, 
a resident of ours. This is a normal view that you would get if you drove around here, a beautiful home. And if you kind of look far in the back, it's a, you can see trucks and a lovely rig just right behind this person's home. Um, just a little bit more about Washington County and how over the past few years it has changed here a lot. Um, just a little definition that we kind of wrote um, about um, at-risk communities. Um, what we describe as at-risk communities are those that can be defined as those with any um, unconventional natural gas development activity currently um, in their neighborhoods or townships. So um, in 2008, we in Washington County had about 10 townships or boroughs. And as of 2014, there were about 32 um, townships that now had um, UNGD in their uh, neighborhoods. Um, so that went from about um, 36,000 um, people being at risk to 117,000. So the population um, went from about 17% in 2008 to over 56% um, percent of our population here in Washington County being at risk of UNGD um, activity in their neighborhood. And just for a better, better visualization of that, um, it kind of just shows the number of wells that we had in 2008. Um, we had 54, and then in 2014, it was all the way up to over 1,100 wells. So this is 20 times what we had in 2008. Um, we've had a lot of questions about with um, industry, how everything is going here. Um, the rate of growth has probably slowed in the last year due to the oversupply of natural gas on the market, but the actual number of wells does continue to climb here in Washington County and our surrounding um, counties. So, um, just Lenny did a great job about telling you guys about um, the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit more of, of a background on us and how we got to where we are now and some of the approaches that got us um, to where we are. So, uh, as our first, as part of our mission to provide timely, accurate, and trusted public health information. The Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project provides environmental health consultations to residents who have health concerns attributed to unconventional natural gas development. Since initiating these assessments in 2012, the health and wellness team has realized the psychological impact on residents of communities experiencing rapid growth of UNGD. Virtually every client who has been assessed by our nurse practitioners report problems with mood, anxiety, and stress. These widespread mental health impacts are consistent with reports in the peer-reviewed literature, such as Resic and Farrar. These mental health impacts are also consistent with, men with multiple studies of the relationship between mental health outcomes and industrial releases of fossil fuel, which document higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders in communities exposed to releases of hazardous materials compared to communities that have been unexposed. Of the psychological problems reported by our clients, stress is definitely the most frequently reported. Associated symptoms of stress affect nearly every aspect of residents' lives. Interviews with our residents suggest multiple sources for UNGD-related stress, including traffic congestion, industrialization of quiet rural areas, changes in community structure due to an influx of workers and their families, uncertainty about potential health effects, and feelings of abandonment by local, state, and federal government agencies. Divisions among neighbors around the costs and benefits of UNGD can magnify these stressors. Given what we have learned from assessments of residents as well as emerging data from the scientific community in 2013, we intentionally expanded our focus to include mental health with a focus on stress. 
Our first approach was a two-pronged process, a program along with stress management handouts. We selected an evidence-based stress management intervention and partnered with community organizations to offer it to residents. Take Steps to Health, marketed by ProChange Behavior Systems, Inc. as the Lifestyle Management Suite, offered a menu of evidence-based modules designed to help individuals improve their health in nine focus areas. Um, the, some of these areas included exercising regularly, healthy eating, managing your moods, weight management, and we really wanted to specifically focus on stress management though. Uh, participants had ac could access the program via a web-based version or one-on-one -on -one by telephone with a health coach, and we had hired two health coaches to help with this program. And this was also available free of charge. Recruitment for this, for Take Steps to Health, was done through um, invitations were sent to 40 of our clients along with, we recruited at a, um, a Cornerstone Care in Burgettstown, PA at a local clinic. Um, we also sent a mailing to 75 healthcare providers to try to have them help us um, have patients get involved with this program. And we also sent a, um, we also held an informational session at another Cornerstone Care Clinic in Mount Morris, PA um, for healthcare providers. And uh, 10 healthcare providers attended that session. Um, unfortunately, at the conclusion of the pilot, only 16 individuals expressed interest in this program. Um, less than five of those 16 individuals had completed more than one module of the program. Um, we found that the content and, pro and the content and format of this program did not appear to meet the needs um, of our clients at this point. And in conjunction, like I had previously said, we were also offering these stress management handouts. Um, we had two different handouts, one that was more of a deep breathing handout that helped people if they were feeling stressed out or overwhelmed, um, gave up to, I think, 30 minutes of how to help you um, breathe, What if you had one minute, what you could do all the way up to 30 minutes, and also um, top help top apps to help you relax. Um, some people I know are more technologically savvy, so some people feel more comfortable on their cell phones or maybe journaling on their cell phones, so we also thought that could be another way to get people to get involved. And unfortunately at this time, um, our clients didn't think these um, handouts were sufficient to address the problems they were facing at this moment. So for our second approach, after the evaluation of the pilot, we recognized the need for more information from community members and began a community-based participatory pilot project. We held um, five focus groups um, with local residents, most of whom were recruited by grassroots organizers because of their concern about unconventional natural gas development. Um, three of the focus groups were held in Washington County, one in Butler County, and one in Westmoreland County. Um, of the five focus groups, um, we had three focus groups, had um, three same-sex groups and two co-ed groups. We thought this was a good idea because we had heard um, from a lot of our residents that sometimes um, family members or friends didn't feel comfortable anymore, maybe speaking in front of a friend or a spouse of the opposite sex, um, telling their opinions anymore. So we thought, okay, we did two focus groups with just women and one with just all men, and then we did two co-ed to see what kind of themes we could get out of these focus groups, if they would be the same or if they would be different. Um, and we scheduled each of these focus groups for about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour to talk, and 15 minutes for refreshments and an explanation of the purpose. And each of these focus groups were asked only three questions. Um, each focus group was asked the same three questions, and these questions were, how does living in a community with um, UNGD make you feel? 
what can be done to help you and or your community, and what are the best methods for addressing question number two, which is what can be done to help you and or your community. And these same questions were asked at each focus group to ensure consistency and reliability. So from these focus groups, we found that the most common themes were stress, worry, helplessness, depression, and anger. And going th back through some of my notes from the focus groups, I found um, some really important things that were said, and I pulled out some of the really powerful ones, such as, they're so big and we're so small. I feel like a prisoner. Peace of mind is taken away. I feel like an outsider and all alone in our community now, in disruption of normal life. So then we asked them what were some common solutions and what could be done. And they told us, these were the four things that came out of it. They told us organizing efficiently and effectively, education on topics like health impacts, legal issues, and air and water monitoring, educating groups like healthcare providers, township supervisors, health departments, and school boards, and also having available resource materials. Um, we definitely think the first bullet, organizing efficiently and effectively, is a very important message for grassroots organizers. Um, also, um, we've always participated in presentations by community groups, but we decided that it was important that we started to step up our own efforts to do our own educational programming through um, fall and spring tours, which you can find that information available on our website. And we also think um, that educating healthcare providers is, is an important part of our mission. So um, this summer we are actually holding our own conference here in Pittsburgh where we will be um, educating um, healthcare providers on shale gas development. So because of this, it brought us to the fourth bullet, having available resource materials materials that we decided we would um, focus on specifically for our project. So what we did next is we drafted a set of resource materials for use by community residents. Uh, these materials were then reviewed by community-based organization leaders from three counties. Um, the three counties were Allegheny, Butler, and Washington at a September 2015 gathering. Um, that meeting helped us to generate ideas about what other needs and resources and how we could then disseminate um, these resources once they were created. Um, the kind of materials that we presented at the 2015 meeting to these community-based organizations were handouts such as how to talk to your healthcare provider about UNGD, protecting your health from U NGD, stress management, emergency planning, different stages of drilling. So this then leads us to where EHP is currently at right now. We are currently at the stage of a where to turn resource guide, um, which is kind of focused on UOGD. I think if you've seen through my presentation, I go back and forth between UNGD and UOGD. When we first started out, um, EHP was kind of focused on UNGD, and now we're focused more on UOGD, unconventional oil and gas development, because we've been contacted nationwide from people asking us about oil and gas, we've kind of are now trying to include everyone that we're trying to make a resource guide that will um, kind of pertain to every, to all of those issues. So now our resource guide um, that we're hoping we're waiting to hear back from a funder that we have submitted a proposal about to try to um, get some money for this resource guide for um, this project, but would be available in hard copy and electronic 
and electronic format to be used and it would be a where to turn resource guide um, for answers about UOGD in the community and for contact information. It would also have um, information on the different stages of development. It would also be able to have um, information on how people could protect their family's help, health if um, stuff they could take to their doctors if you have these health symptoms, um, coping mechanisms for psychosocial issues and how to minimize your exposures, and what to do to track and understand chemical exposures from UOGD. So things like list of chemicals and your, their characteristics, um, where to get baseline testing, because um, sometimes when you um, can actually get your air and water tested, then you don't understand what those results mean, so how, where we could help you find someone who could actually interpret those results for you. Um, just having answers to questions like that, we found can already help people reduce their stress. So um, just answers to questions like that, we found could easily help to reduce people's stress. Um, another thing we've been working on here is um, a healthcare Provider's Guide to Mental Health Impacts of Unconventional Oil and Gas Development. It's a two-page handout broken down into three parts, kind of an introduction and assessment of the problem. And then it talks about the mental health in the fossil fuel industry, kind of what studies um, of communities impacted by fossil fuel industries and what has happened and where those communities are at when it comes to mental health issues. and then the third part focuses on mental health and UOGD, what community studies and qualitative studies are out there now. And this is kind of just a draft of what it looks like. And we're hoping to get this out to um, PCPs in the area and also mental health care providers, anyone who is willing to listen and um, learn about this issue. So that's another project we've been working on. We're really trying to educate um, the healthcare community out there about this issue. Um, another thing that EHP, like I said, has been working on to try to educate the public about this issue is a conference on health and shale gas development. Um, this is for all um, community members and also healthcare providers. Um, there will also be a breakout session on mental health and unconventional oil and gas development. Um, and actually Lydia Greiner, um, who will be speaking next week, um, I think like Lenny had said on the SF36 and her research, she'll be speaking next week. She's actually, um, I think, in charge of the breakout session at this June 10th conference leading the mental health and unconventional oil and gas development. So she will be speaking about this. So we're, again, really trying to educate all of the um, healthcare professionals out there who are willing to listen to us about um, mental health and about unconventional oil and gas development in general. So here at EHP, we're really trying to do our best at um, whatever we can do to educate those who are willing to listen to us. So that's what we are doing on our end right now. And I want to thank you for your time. And like Lenny said, this is the group that works with us and um, wouldn't be possible without them. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Great, thank you, Jessa, for that. Very interesting, and I think it was really, you know, useful to be able to hear all the great work that you guys are doing, and and also the findings from the focus groups that you that you've been, um, that you know, the, the work that came out of the focus groups, um, and also just all the um, educational resources that you guys are putting together. So really excellent, um, and I think there's a number of questions about that. So we're now going to uh, wrap up and start the actual um, Q and A session. Um, so we've been getting some questions that are coming in um, during the presentations here. So I'm just going to go ahead um, and put each of you speakers, uh, I'm going to unmute each of you so that you can um, answer accordingly. Uh, give me just one second. Okay. Ah. All right. So we have the first question here is for Lenny. Um, and Lenny, the question is, what kind of biomonitoring would you recommend around natural gas compressor stations? 
Um, well, as, as I had mentioned before, those metabolic panels that look at liver function and kidney function, those are the two organs of the body that uh, eliminate waste products. Also probably lung functions um, to make sure of any changes in that. Also probably thyroid function, I mean that, uh, and following it over a period of time to see if there's any changes. Um, there are specific uh, uh, tests that are done uh, for biomonitoring, but as I talked to um, the toxicologist at UPMC, Dr. Aaron Maris, um, these are set up for industry, people who are um, in the industry who have been exposed and within an eight-hour period. Um, Often in the communities, you have low levels of chronic exposure that it may be more difficult to monitor. Great, thank Hello? you. Okay. Yep, no, we heard you. Great. Okay, mm -hmm. now this is a question I think for um, um, both both of you that are with the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. What are um, when when is the resource directory going to be available? Did you did you? I, we weren't sure if you made a date for that, Jessa. No, we don't have a date for that. Um, we're still kind of, we're moving forward, but we are waiting on um, funding for that, um, which I will have a final, um, I'll find out about my funding for my proposal in June. So I'll, I won't really know till June how that's going. So, so, so maybe it, we could, maybe we could, we'll figure out to to be able to get that information to those that are curious to see that um, at the time. Yes, the time and that um, and that resource guide will not be just for Washington County; it will be for multiple counties. Great. So, if that, yeah, I'm not sure if that person is from Washington mm -hmm. County or where they're from, but it won't be just specific to Washington County. The project is set to be from multiple counties. So. Great, to and then a and just, audience. Yes. great, and then and just for clarification purposes, that that will be it's really to address um, natural gas, right? I mean, not so much. Yes. Okay. Right. right. Exactly. Okay, so it it would would not be really applicable, although uh, for for those communities in California, for example, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't um, you know use that model maybe to to develop their own. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, there'll be certain things in the um, resource guide that obviously are maybe specific to certain things, like if we had contact numbers, like contact your local um, Department of Health, if that number was in that book, obviously that wouldn't be the correct number for someone in California. But yeah, there's certain things, but most of the stuff will be um, able for anyone else to use, yes. Okay, great. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next question, which um, is for Larissa. And the question was, um, are there particular studies that you would point someone out to to be able to understand uh, the vulnerable populations and children perspective as it relates to mental health and stress? Are there particular studies that you found to be particularly useful uh, for someone to read on? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, some very good references uh, from Harvard that I used in preparation for this. Um, so um, I could make those available uh, once I once I'm off of uh, offline and uh, um, able to or off of this webinar and I uh, can make it available. Ellen, if you could uh, get that person contact information. Absolutely. I'd be I'll happy to that. do that. Yep. Okay, great. Um, now, then we have another question here, and this is um, for Lenny. You mentioned using spectrometers in your research, uh, trying to assess, um, I believe, I'm not sure if it was um, metal oh, concentrations or with pregnant women. And so they, they just were curious about how you went about oh, it. No, 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 no. Um, I, I, it, the spec monitors um, are, we use, we have spec monitors that, um, we uh, lend out to clients to measure the PM in the air, the, uh, the um, particulate matter in the air. And it is um, it's a SPEC, S-P-E-C-K, SPEC monitor. And I work uh, closely with um, Ryan um, uh, Grody, who is the environmental um, health person who, uh, who uh, sets these up in homes, one inside the home and one outside the home. 
Um, so it's a spec monitor, and it's to monitor the PM in the air, the particulate matter, over a period of time. Great, thank it's you. Not for that. Just, it's not just with the pregnant women, it's, it's people in general. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, another question here for you, Lenny, about the qualitative methods that you talked about. Um, what particular um, methods did you use? Uh, what were your qualitative methods? Were they focus group discussions, or what kind of, was it based on a participatory um, research model? No. Um, what we did is we, um, we, we put flyers up in the three counties, and we asked, we, um, it was a study about the meaning of health in the context of environment, and the women um, would call us, and it was, it was focused mainly on women, uh, they would call us, and what we would do is set up an appointment in the home, and this had IRB, I mean, we went through Duquesne University Review Board, uh, so it was a research study in the sense of we interviewed people in their homes, and we interviewed them twice, and it's, it was, the question was, Tell tell me what it means to you. What does health mean to you in the context of the environment? We never mentioned fracking. We never mentioned anything about gas, and but gas came up um, uh, frequently. And then uh, and then what we did is uh, we did a qualitative we did a uh, analysis a thematic analysis of the themes that came out on, on the women and the three of us um, looked at all of the transcripts separately and then we came together to for intercoder reliability to see what um, themes had come up um, the most frequently and then we went back to the women and we uh, validated we we had uh, member checking we said to them are these are these the themes uh, are we correct uh, in in, um, in in the analysis of the interviews, is this what you meant? Great. Great, thank you. Okay, there's another question here. Um, the question is, how would you circulate the healthcare provider's guide, and I think they mean the resource directory, to mental health in counties where the hospital was built by industry, or if the industry makes massive contributions to the facility? This is common um, in Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, Lenny, you can help me out on this one if you'd like. But how we would um, distribute? I I'm sorry. Yeah. The question yeah, I'll again. The question please. again. Yeah, sure. The question is, how would you circulate the healthcare providers guide, and I think they mean the resource directory, to mental health in counties? where the hospital was built by industry or if industry makes massive contributions to the facility. Yeah, um, I think one of the ways is to is through the professional organizations, and also to make it available, um, like on the internet, um, to make it. It may not be specifically like to an institution. It would may be to individual healthcare providers. You know, through the organizations, um, the professional organizations. That'd be one way. Um, another would be to distribute it through clients who come to us to take it to their primary care providers. Okay, great. That's just some ideas. Yeah, no, that's yeah, good. yeah. I think it might not be as big, like all at once, as we would hope it to be. Like we can't just go there and drop off a hundred, two hundred of them at once and say, "Here you go." But I think it's going to be a little bit at a time. But hopefully me being with, you know, the National Association of Social Workers and Lenny knowing with all the nurses and everything she works with, you know, and our clients are good and with all the organizations yeah. we work with little by little, you know, maybe we can chip away and you know, get, you know, our foot in the door little by little. You know, an another thing to consider is the power of the, p the client who is seeking health care providers, that that an informed, an informed patient, an informed client, the informed public going to their providers can make choices of what providers to go to in many cases. Um, and they can educate their providers about what's important to them. Yeah. Great, thank you. So we have a few more questions here. The next question here is for the EHTP. And again, the question is, um, are any of the participants in the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project 
organizing a suit against the UNGD and UOGD industries or DEP individuals. Is EHP? Um, no, not that I know of. Not no. that I know of. No. Okay. All right. Um, another question here about the fall and spring tours, um, Jessa, that you mentioned. Um, yes. Are those are those like site visits, or how can people find out more information about that? So people that want um, to see the, that's up available on our website, and I also sent out an email blast today, and it's available on our website. Okay. So if they go to environmentalhealthproject.org, it's okay. on our website. Yeah. We'll um, be presenting then, different information on health and mental health and about what we know about water and different um, things located in different counties and, yeah, around okay, southwest great. Pennsylvania. All right, good. Um, and then we have a question here. Is it possible to receive uh, online the visuals uh, that were used by um, the speakers, each of you? Our PowerPoint presentations? Yeah. So that's entirely up to you guys. If you if you want to share those, one way would be you could put them into PDF form if you if you'd want to share them. Um, they are they are going to be. I mean, this is going to be recorded and will be put up on the website. So I'm just letting alerting attendees to that. Um, so I don't know if the the person that asked that question, perhaps you'd maybe want to wait for the recording. Um, we can get back to them if you want. If you're comfortable. Otherwise, just let me know. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem if. Um giving my PowerPoint in PDF if they would like. Um, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, and then there's a, there were several questions about the recording, um, both because last week um, there was an interruption, um, mm -hmm. which, which was unfortunate. So I just wanted to let everyone know that, yes, we are uh, working on that recording, and that will be up on the website for the first webinar um, as soon as we can get that done. And then, the, yes, the recording for, the, for this session and the last session will be up as well. Um, so it looks like we will now wrap up. Um, if attendees have additional questions, please um, feel welcome to con you know, continue to send those in. There may be a few. Let me see here. Um, there's, one, there's, a, there's a few other questions here, but I'll just I'll forward those along to, to the rest of you guys after. Um, so we'll now wrap up. I'm just going to um, put here some information for the next session and you can get some information for registration and also for to learn more about a Center for Environmental Health and also to learn more about uh, the Southwest Environmental Health Project and all the great work that they've been doing. Um, so remember next week we have our final session um, which is going to be the same time on Monday, March 14th. So from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern, um, and this will be our final session. We'll be hearing from researchers as they provide uh, and talk about the research, research they've been doing to inform policy outcomes. Um, so we hope that you'll join us for that session. And please feel welcome to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and also, don't forget, we're going to be sending out a survey. So please, if you just take a few minutes to answer that, that would be fabulous. So thank you again to all the speakers. You really, We really appreciate the time that you put in for this. And... We look forward to um, having everyone back again next week. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.